Hello and welcome to the Calling Birmingham episode of Steel First Speaks. I think we're on episode like 56 now or something, which is a bit crazy. You know, we've been doing this channel for over three years and averaging, you know, one episode every two weeks or something like that. Um, a bit mad. But anyway, I'm Steel Fur, host of Steel First Speaks, otherwise known as Finbar. Um, you can find me at most Flesh and Blood events in the UK and Europe. I sometimes travel to America, um, but you know, it's not that not that regular. And, you know, obviously this weekend, starting tomorrow even, we have the Calling Birmingham coming up, which is going to be really exciting. I am going, I haven't 100% locked a deck yet, but I'm probably playing Fi. Um, and we'll get onto why I'm playing Fi in a minute, because I think it's important to understand, like, my logic and where I am at in my fab journey currently, and how I think that interacts with my, you know, how I interact and understand the game right so because because that kind of ties into the whole title of this video because when i say i'm not going to the event to win it really what i'm saying is i don't feel like i will win i mean it, anyone can have a run of good luck and really the the core of this episode is i want to talk about engagement with fab from a casual or competitive standpoint and the the mind shift change required to you know, for, for many people, I would say, including myself, to actually sit down and enjoy flesh and blood in a casual way, but also going to local large events and talk about how this shift um, occurred for me and like why it's continued when I didn't really think it would. So break it down. We finished Nationals last year. We're kind of before Nationals last year. And I just have a lot going on in terms of like work, trying to get fit. I've been in the gym like three times a week since... um uh since uh may or april um you know doing doing really well actually on on my latest fitness journey which is good but obviously it leaves me tired physically tired a lot of the time um just playing a lot of other games uh one of the guys i follow a lot on twitch uh preach gaming he's based in the uk really great guy plays a lot of different mmos and games which i really respect and one of the things he kind of helped me understand through his own break with World of Warcraft a few years ago, um, which kind of coincided with my own big break from World of Warcraft, because it used to be the game that I played continuously, is that there is a calculation that goes on when you're playing any game with your limited free time, because you've got to go to the gym and you've got to eat and you've got to cook good food and you've got to do stuff with your partner um, and work, obviously, and then fix up the house and all these chores, is that with every game... In existence there is a calculation of how much time am i spending on one game and how much value am i getting out of that interaction with that game compared to playing something brand new right and that was a really big revelation to me because i i a world of warcraft gamer right i have over a year of play time in world of warcraft right like play time and okay a lot of that was leaving the character logged in you know doing something silly you know leaving it on for a few hours a day while i was cooking you know not logging out properly um occasionally using um you know macros and those kind of things to not get logged out of the game because the queues were crazy and all that kind of stuff so i probably haven't actually played the game for a full year of gameplay time since i was 12 but you know i'm 33 now and I put a lot of hours into that game and I realized actually that if you look at the hours not a lot of them are what I would consider efficient hours and by that I mean was I really enjoying the way that I was playing the game or was I grinding for something that I thought I needed or I didn't need did I actually get the satisfaction out of that grind and was the payoff like you know if you spend three hours a day grinding for a netherwing drake or something was the payoff actually worth the investment that i put in in terms of like well just either in terms of serotonin or looking back at the memories um you know because for better or worse i end up being a solo gamer a lot of the time you know i don't have a lot of um people will know this about me like my fans and people who've tried to talk to me at events like if i'm doing something like playing an event i actually find it quite hard to disassociate from thinking about the game to move into more of a chatty mood so a lot of the time i end up playing 
kind of solo you know and in world of warcraft playing kind of solo doing raids obviously i had a raiding guild that i had fun with but when it came to actual serious playing focusing on the game not being as chatty and that kind of led to a point where you're kind of looking at this time that you spent and you say could i have had more fun as someone who gets a lot out of his solo experiences um playing a different game right or learning a different gaming system or spending more time interacting with a different game and the reason i talk i'm talking about world of warcraft is that that was the biggest example of my life of where i learned that lesson that i needed to constantly be evaluating not not constantly like you don't want to overthink things but regularly just evaluating my interaction with a game at a specific point and just trying to see and keeping my mind open to the fact there might be other ways of having fun that don't involve just constantly sticking into and grinding with a specific game. Now, a lot of people will be looking at me and being like, well, duh, right, duh, stupid. Like, that's just cool being casual. But I think it's important that, like, for, for people like me and for people with my kind of brain, I mean, I have dyspraxia. I um, tend to fixate on projects and tasks, um, you know, often at the expense of timekeeping and other things. You know, my friends will say, I haven't seen you in a couple of weeks because I will have just been so focused on doing something around the house or a latest project or writing a book, for example, uh, which I'm doing now uh, and actually surprising myself even by managing to keep my focus up even after the initial two, three week period where I was super keen. I'm actually managing to keep going, which is kind of good for me and uh, interesting. But the reason that I say that is that this big learning of understanding that it's okay to step away from a game kind of came to me when I was thinking about how much I had spent and invested in fab last year versus what else I could be doing um so we were there you know kind of just before nationals and I realized what I would need to do to grind to get good enough for Nats in the UK and it was warm I mean I can remember it being warm for some reason and I had people who wanted to do things. So I just went and did did the things and played the board games, uh, played a bit of World of Warcraft Classic with my friends and didn't worry so much about playing Flesh and Blood as much and getting super, super good as I have stressed out about before other tournaments. And I had fun at Nats. I came like 16th or 13th again, which was frustrating. Um, you know... Mostly on the strength of my drafting, not really on the strength of CC. I lost some CC matches I probably shouldn't have just due to misplays, but I went 6-0 in the draft, so I did very well. Um, and then I thought, well, okay, you're clearly not into this right now. Let's take a break again. Um, you know, let's take a proper break. And I did take a proper break. You know, I didn't make any videos. I uh, didn't make any content, just kind of chilled out. Um, and then I started playing the game again in like february but still not going to like every single armory every single week just just kind of chilling and during that point i i've there's been an ongoing discussion right with myself which is should i be you know trying to find a testing team again getting hard into the game you know actually committing and putting in the time because in the past i haven't really i've been part of teams but i've just been kind of like you know, coasting, playing some games here and there, joining in the discussions, but not, you know, not like seriously, you know, I think I played 70 games before Pro Tour 1, but I didn't really get up like some other people were playing 200 more than that, giving, you know, really detailed feedback notes. So, you know, do I want to go in that hard? And if I don't, then what's my actual engagement in FAB? And, and how do I defy, like, derive joy from it? And I kind of really decided that ultimately I needed to limit certain things in fab to maximize the opportunity cost of the game with other things that i was doing because i still wanted to raid once a week with my team in in warcraft classic wrath of the lich king and i still wanted to learn new card games you know i've got sorcery coming and lorcana coming i've been playing a load of soul forge fusion um i've been playing things like birmingham city of brass uh, with people i've been you know, looking at new D&D &D campaigns I might want to run, you know, and all these other things that are gaming and they are fun. And I haven't really had much time to do because of, of playing Flesh and Blood. So it was kind of my decision that, at least for that period, that I would de-emphasize Flesh and Blood and do other things. 
But then we come up to something like the Calling Birmingham. First UK Calling, I'm super excited for it. And about two or three months ago, I was trying to sit there and decide, will I go in hard, you know, try and do my best? Will I find people to play with, um, to test with regularly, start actually asking people, you know, can I join your testing group? What do you want from me in exchange? You know, I am a the sort of person who needs that kind of, I need expectations. And I know some people get it from social contracts and they understand what they need to do based on what everyone else is doing. But really, I I, I find that part difficult, you know, um, healthy dose of social anxiety and things like that. So, you know, expectations from other people, you know, if you want to play with us and be part of our testing group, you know, we kind of expect people to play 20 games a week and give like give, you know, significant feedback on we'll say five of the games they played and what that made them think about the meta like that kind of thing would actually be something very very valuable and if those expectations were there and i would you know be meeting them but the question was would i would i try and get involved in that or would i just play whatever looked fun you know and then whenever birmingham came around i would think about it and try and make a decision based on what I felt comfortable playing and what maybe felt good into the field, but was I wasn't going to make a lot of mistakes. And then the RTN season happened and I kind of took this philosophy in, but I kind of went to play a deck I wasn't that comfortable with um, in order to kind of, because it was one of the best decks in the format and I had experience on it previously. I was like, I can just play old him, right? But old him, of course, one of the things I liked about it previously and one of the things that was still true in the RTN season really was like really did change based on the matchup and change over time. And you couldn't just full block everything. You had to, you know, control your blocks, block efficiently, send back the three for eights. You know, there was there was a play pattern there that had developed while I hadn't been playing the game which I hadn't really had time to appreciate properly, which led to me, you know, um, playing Ultim in an RTN, making silly mistakes, you know, going 0-3, and kind of just looking at it being like, am I going to do that again, right? And obviously, that was not a fun experience. I lost three games and went home when I could have played six rounds, you know. Um, but I wasn't having fun because I was making mistakes. So then the thought is like, well, I kind of need to engage with Fab enough that I'm not making silly mistakes in tournaments, right? I mean, that that's kind of a basic basic level but also i think need to be a bit more tactical about what deck i'm playing if i'm going to engage with the game casually right so that kind of brings us around to the calling birmingham and trying to figure out how i'm going to engage with it and that kind of brings us around as well to the title of this video because on the on the deck list choices right i have tons of cards i mean just grab a stack i think there's majestics in any stack in here What's in this stack? Oh, we've got Pulse of Eisenloft. Cool. Um, got Pulverize, Rainbow Foil. Sure. Um, Hypothermia, Oak and Old. Okay, so that's my old him stack. Uh, oh, there's a full drone my deck here on my desk. Cool. Uh, oh, that's a Gold Foil Null Rune Hood. That's for sale, by the way. Um, oh, there's a Prism deck. Basically, and my point is I have all of these fab cards, right? I could play any of these decks. It's not really not really the question and the top decks i mean lexi okay i don't have ranger cards but i could have borrowed them levia i have those cards i open them in the thing uh icelander i love i have those cards fine um where else do we go bravo could play that uh dromai could definitely play that and you're looking at all these lists and being like all of these have a level of complexity that i haven't really earned uh, and all of these have a level of complexity that I can't really do justice. So am I going to enjoy playing them? Or am I going to have a frustrating time? Because nothing frustrates me more than when I make a mistake that I realize shortly afterwards, oh, shouldn't have done it that way, um, in playing the deck. So like, because one of the things I enjoy about Fab is evaluating the hand and evaluating it correctly to do the right decision, including what you might want to do later. And when I misevaluate that, that's a big, big problem for me. So um, that's kind of like the difficult, difficult analysis, right, of what deck to play. Because there's the best decks in the format. They take reps. They take 
complexity maybe i could just build a levia deck tonight and high roll but i will be going in with no practice of any of the mirrors no practice of the games or do i take a deck that i like that i know and that is okay right okay but not probably going to win a lot but except the fact that i may not win right that i may not even do amazingly well and except the fact that you know there are side events running all weekend that i can probably have a lot of fun in you know i'm still quite good at sealed at draft right I mean, sealed is just whatever you get but i am still quite good at limited format events even without the huge amount of practice in classic constructed so eve and i still have side event tickets because i bought a fabled package so if i go in on saturday and i crash out I really, really need to. And this is my main goal for the event. This is why I'm saying my goal, my purpose of going to the calling is not to win. My actual purpose going to the calling is to find a way to... Because I, I am competitive by nature in terms of how I get endorphins through tournaments. I get them through making good plays. I get them through winning games. So my big challenge really this weekend is to potentially lose a lot at the calling because I'm playing Fi, which is a a good deck but it's not it's not it's not tier one it's not top of the pops you know um top of the pops by the way uk show uh where they brought on the top bands of the charts every week and had them play um on stage and they went through their top 40 every week so that's a reference for you americans it's kind of just like a live chart show uh very exciting um so and yeah yeah very fun and <laughs> So, but I'm not, I'm not playing that deck and I might get some wins and I might get some losses, but likely is I'm not going to make day two of the calling with a good enough record to do anything there except maybe get some cash. And even if I do that, right, who knows? So I need to go in with the ability and the foresight that when I start losing on day one to not basically tilt myself into the ground to the point where I don't want to play side events i'm not fun to be around i'm you know i want to go home right those three things that could happen if we're being honest you know i'm in round three i've gone zero three in the calling i've lost a ton of elo and i just hate myself right the goal then for me just super massive goal we're being honest is to find out mentally how to drop from that tournament without feeling like i'm an idiot who doesn't know how to play flesh and blood and you know doesn't deserve to be there right and and to move on to side events to you know having fun right because previously at all these large events i have only ever engaged in the main event i've even joked that's why i'm there you know and it has it has worked i've made day two of every pro tour i've been to um I went 6-1 on in Pro Tour Lille on day one. You know, um, I was in the I was at the top top tables for the draft, and you know, barring one draft mishap, um, and then just you know, I even finished actually wait, I even finished the second draft on course for potential top eight, and then just completely tanked in CC on the second day. So you know, that is how I've engaged with all of these tournaments. So when I say I'm not going to the event to win, really what I'm saying is I'm trying to learn how to go to the event not needing to win to feel like I've had a good time. And that's kind of like a big takeaway for me, you know, for a gamer. And, you know, I have dyspraxia, so I'm not great already at games with Twitch reactions like League of Legends or shooters. There's a whole range of games I am not good at because I lack good reflexes and hand-eye coordination. So you'd think I'm already used to losing because I was never the kid who was good at sports. But actually what's happened is I've just got more bitter about losing, right? So I've, I've, I, when, I've when I found the games that I can do without, um, you know, without needing to rely on hand-eye coordination, then... I, I get more passionate about trying to win them. But funny funny enough, just as a little tangent, um, like how dyspraxia interacts with games like Fab, which a lot of people don't realize. So dyspraxia is a hand-eye coordination um, disorder. And one of the things about it is that it takes you more time and mental energy 
to perform physical actions, even simple physical actions. So that interacts with card games in a very interesting way. Um, you will notice that I never play a hero like Dash for a very, very simple reason. The mental energy required for an entire day to pick up and put down small tokens is not a big deal for the majority of people. But if I have to do it like six times a turn for every single like turn cycle, I, I'm going to be wrecked after like three or four games because I'm going to have to think, where do I take this token? Where do I put it? I have to analyze movements a lot more. Um, so that's why typically I'm playing heroes that don't have those token based gameplay um styles uh they are they are actually exhausting um and though but those things can add up in in normal hero play uh over the course of events so sometimes you end up in round six or seven and you're just absolutely exhausted because you've had really long games and you've kind of just had to move a lot of little pieces it's one of the reasons that old him was kind of okay because although you were playing to fatigue you weren't actually tracking anything you just put a token on your um your armor every now and then you just pitched and tracked your pitch every now and then but you weren't actually doing a lot of like micro movements with tokens and things like that you were just playing with cards which are nice big and very easy to move um so that's it i mean that's really for the topic of the video i mean i'm probably playing five this weekend if you see me on something else it just means i've gone on a massive testing hole this evening um, i'm recording this on thursday um, and I'm planning on playing 10, 15 games of Fab on Talashar this evening. If you see me, uh, I won't have Chad on, so don't say hi. Because um, <laughs> I just, I'm not, well, I'm not turning Chad on on Talashar anymore. Um, there's been weird people on there, so I'd rather not. And yeah, I mean, that's really it. That's kind of the conclusion I want to put into this episode. Um, I hope this has resonated with a lot of people without coming across as like too self-serving. I imagine there are some people being like, duh, how did this guy not learn this lesson before? But I feel like this has been an important part of a journey for me as a gamer and as someone who plays Flesh and Blood to learn how to prioritize other forms of enjoyment, other games, to learn how to, you know, I, I've never been a sore loser. I've never taken it out on my opponent. Well, maybe once or twice, but typically as a rule, I, I'm not. I just take it out internally. And one of the big things I think to learn to do is to, to not do that. And I hope that message at least has resonated with some other people. Um, you know, hopefully this wasn't <laughs> obvious to everyone but me, but I, I have a feeling it wasn't. Um, and I have a feeling that as we get more and more into this idea that Fab is a casual game, I'm going to be talking about how people engage with Fab productively in a casual setting. And that's kind of a video I've planned to do um in a couple of videos time is to talk about i'm a casual player what should i be doing in flesh and blood both in terms of like what heroes you can choose um you know how many heroes you should keep a stable uh, number of cards for and also in terms of like what sort of events you should be looking to go into uh and those kind of things so that video is coming up um but in the meantime i thought i'd make this video um you know as content creators i think a lot of people realize this as well because because you know tall timmy uh quit recently and there's um you know that's obviously a question mark uh and obviously sad for a lot of the community because he was a very big part of the community um but you know content creators we have these personal journeys relating to the games that we play as well and they're not all you know they're not always so straightforward as to be like i'm someone who loves the game i love the game 24 7 i'm always here for the game now, obviously, when I'm making a video, I want to give people that energy and I want to inspire people to participate in the game by transmitting that energy to them. But I feel like it's important to balance that with the other side of it, which is you can go super hard and you can pay someone to coach you to be very good at fab. There are, there are some great coaches out there. There are people I know that I'm sure they do fantastic coaching, you know, like Shamir um, from London, who... Um, has top aided at a pro tour i know quite a few people who go to him for coaching and say that he's really good you know he gives this is not an advert for shamir but i just mean as an example you know you could pay someone to teach you to be good at the game and then you could find a local play group and all raise each other up to be good at the game you know there are ways as a casual player to get involved in competitive fab and to ride those highs and lows of winning and losing but I also think that what this game needs and one of the things I'm trying to learn personally 
is the ma- mindset that says I'm okay going to this tournament without every single piece of equipment that I could play, uh, without a spring tunic. I'm okay going to an armory and losing, um, you know, going to one. I'm still going to show up for the calling, even if I don't have the perfect tuned deck. You know, I'm going to participate in the game as much as I can, as a personal choice, and then get as much enjoyment from it as I can do as a as a person. And if a set comes out that doesn't have any support for my heroes, maybe I'll take a break until the next limited set comes out. You know, maybe I'll just keep playing the game at a low ebb until they make druid and i just go full hard again because druid is the best class in any uh fantasy or or game setting right so you know maybe that's how you engage in fab now i'm not saying that's what i'm going to do personally i fully expect myself to still be playing fab at a competitive level um i am looking for a pti for world so if you have listened to this far in the video then you are probably a fan and that means you should sell me a pti with a discount just saying get in touch and <laughs> you know I'm, I'm just saying i do a lot of work on this channel maybe someone should sell me a pti with a discount anyway uh or not i mean if you just give me a good price i'll probably buy it anyway um but i want to play fab competitively and i will have probably one or two hallmark events a year either a european pro tour or worlds where i actually do try and you know put in those hours and hours of work to grind through a really good deck and start reaching out to people aggressively being like hey can i test with you i have this much free time i'm here i just want to play the game and talk about it you know can we play and i will do that right but i think it's 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 important for me and i think it will be important for other people one of the reasons why the main reason i did this video to think about the times when that isn't the case and to ask yourself am i burning out on flesh and blood am i playing it too much should i play something else you know great games with great stories final fantasy Baldur's gate 3 is coming out and they have put a spore druid in so i can make fucking spore mushroom zombies that's going to be awesome so you know engaging with the game in a more healthy way and i think that's super important and i think it's a discussion that every community in the fab universe is going to have to have and i think one of the things that lss is doing to help this which i really appreciate is that new professor um professor uh professor uh upf box the four player upf box um so like that's going to come in and people who've never played um fab but have three friends are going to buy it and play the game casually and one of the biggest discussions that we as a community have to have isn't just about how we interact with competitive events but also how we interact with casual gaming in a way that they makes those upf players feel like they can transition to blitz um you know transition to playing games more casually and um, one of the biggest problems i personally have with fab um and I've kind of said this before, is that when I organized, when I ran the games for my local shop, which I don't do at the moment, um, and I organized Commoner, the first thing that people said, even though we had new players coming, was how can I break this format? Oh, Stubby Hammerers isn't banned. Okay, I'm building this chain deck with Stubby Hammerers, right? Rather than going into their stable of cards and going into Icelander and being like, can I make... Uh, I can't even think of an example now like a full brain freeze deck that really just disrupts my opponent's hand like that you know something on the edge of playing which may not be a hundred percent it might not win you the cold foil that week but it's different it's fun um and this to this by the same token you know if if people show up to blitz every weekend with a suite of four legendary equipment and a fine-tuned deck that has two cnc two e-strike two art of war and then they wonder why the new players who just bought a blitz deck and like a couple booster packs don't stick around right because they got absolutely trumped and the only way for them to actually match the decks that they've been beaten by is to drop another three or four hundred quid so that's not happening like like you see you see what i'm getting at here and i think that's an interesting point we'll probably have to come back to um this episode's kind of hit where we are and, and kind of hit the points um but that's it 
Uh, the only other thing, so of course, at 30 minutes, I only expect really true fans to be listening. Um, I am launching either pins or T-shirts soon. Um, guys, you'll know I have these T-shirt symbols, the Arachne, uh, but as a bear. Um, I'll be giving those out to anyone who's playing against me with a copy of um, No Good Deed Goes Unpunished at The Calling. Um, but also I'm starting either a T-shirt line or a line of pins uh, that are kind of called my Druid Wen pins. Um, I know that there are fans of Druid out there. I know it's not just me. It is one of the most popular classes, especially in games like Diablo 4. And I think we need Druid in Fab. I think Briar is just a Runeblade who pretends to be a Druid and she doesn't count. Um, so I'm launching either a series of T-shirt. I'm just working on the designs. I'm doing some mid-journey stuff because I'm poor and can't afford to pay an actual artist right now. Uh, but maybe I'll pay someone once I've got a good concept of what I want um, through one of the AI tools. Um, I'll pay someone to actually refine it and make it into a good thing. But then I'm going to have t-shirts and badges available for those people who like Druid as well. And it's just maybe the start of a little social movement to show LSS how many people like and respect the Druid class and want the class to be in the game. That's it, really. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh it's just a little tidbit once it's ready i'll i'll get it out there um also chapter seven of the book if you haven't read chapter six i mean it's it's super long it's really in deep depth it's kind of the third part of the arc of pierce who is the light mage from solana so remember there are three main characters of the book there's ichika who's a ninja from um from aria she no from aria from mysteria she's an earth ninja um, who throws shuriken as her main weapon. Um, there is Pierce, who is a light mage from Solana. And there is a third character who is looking like he's going to be a druid, um, just because of personal preference. Um, but he might be someone from, like, the pits or something like that. I haven't really sort of figured it out yet, because um, he's not coming up for another two or three chapters. So I haven't... I've started to lay the framework. Um, but so the, the third chapter... So chap sorry, chapter six... It's kind of like the end of Pierce's stay in Solana because all the characters are being brought to Aria one at a time. And it's just really epic. So, you know, there's a massive fight with demons as they work to defend a town from this huge demon army. They're outnumbered massively and they have to fight their way through and try and sort of survive. Um, and, you know, there's something wrong with Pierce's magic, which you will have learned in chapter um, four or five. Uh, so... You know, things are going weird and they kind of get kind of grim near the end. Like it's not a it's not a light hearted fantasy novel, should we say it that way? It really does get to grips with what it means to be from Solana and what you know, what they're willing to do to protect their faith. Let's put it that way. So if that catches your interest, please do have a read and let me know if you have any thoughts, because I have Six chapters written. There are going to be 21 in total. So we are almost a third of the way there. Um, which means, you know, the journey should be done probably this year. If I can keep writing a chapter every two weeks slash month, depending on how detailed the chapter is, then we'll probably get there by the middle or halfway through next year. But if some of the chapters are shorter, which they should be, then I can write one every two weeks. We might even finish by Christmas. Um but in the meantime yeah i hope you found this video interesting if you're still listening uh i i put a lot into it just in terms of my own mental thoughts and processes and kind of like current feelings about flesh and blood it it's a fantastic game i really do look forward to all the time i spend playing it and i really do make as much time in my life as i can to play this game because there is nothing more fun than sitting down at my local armory and just having you know some games and a beer and some chats and the calling should have that feeling for me as well you know if i'm not super prepared i should just be going with the intention of having some fun and not kicking myself in the teeth because i've lost a game or two and i go on a negative record and that's that's just just what it is so if if any of this has echoed with you just let give me a give me a note in the comments let me know i'm not i'm not alone and uh <laughs> And that's it, really. Uh, this is Steel Fur, I guess, stopping speaking for at least a day or so. I have to rest my voice until we uh, 
until we get to the actual calling, as I imagine I'll be talking nonstop all weekend. Thank you, everyone, and have a great calling if you're there. Do come and say hello. I am friendly. I try to be more friendly. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I'll try to be more friendly and less distracted in the game and uh, talk to all of you a bit more. So do come and say hello. If you want a sticker for your deck box, do let me know. Um, and you can have one of those. I should have a few spare. And of course, if you're playing me, make sure you do not leave without a promo and a sticker as that is something that I would like to give out to people. Otherwise, they're just in my deck box and not really doing anything. So talk to you all soon and have a great weekend wherever you are.